That was some passage that uh, was read this morning in Jeremiah. And if y'all want to go ahead and turn to Lamentations 4 as we close up that chapter today. That passage that uh, Marty read this morning in Jeremiah chapter uh, chapter 5, verses 15 through 31, that was very revealing uh, chapter. I mean, a passage in that chapter. And it was a prophecy of what was going to happen uh, to Judah. And the Lord says, I will bring a nation upon you, O house of Israel, uh, a mighty nation, an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. And the Lord is telling them that He's going to judge them. Because verse 21 says, O foolish people, and without understanding, who have eyes and see not, who have ears and hear not, fear ye not me, saith the Lord. No, they didn't. They didn't fear the Lord. They trusted in their own devices. He said in verse 23 of Jeremiah chapter 5 that these people have, these people have a rebellious, a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear or reverence the Lord. Our God, the one who gives the rain, both the former, that's the spring, and the latter rains in its season. He reserves unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. No one wants to give any credit due to God for climate change. We just blame mankind for it. We don't look at climate change as possibly God trying to get us to listen to Him because the Bible says that in the book of Ecclesiastes that God controls the currents of the wind. It is the wind currents in the jet stream that bring the rain, that brings the high pressure and the low pressure. That's what drives where the rain goes or misses. And the Bible says that it is God who drives the jet stream. No one wants to say that. Go to Psalm 107 where it says that God can take a, a beautiful place and turn it into a wasteland. And it says the reason why is because of the wickedness of them that dwell therein. People don't want to believe that. To a lot of people that's hate speech. Because they don't want to hear why God is bringing the rain or why God is withholding the rain. Why there is drought and so much dry tender. You can work the forest floor all you want to, but if God wants to bring judgment, you can clean it up. We could eat off of it and it still wouldn't stop judgment. People are not learning from God's Word. They're not learning. Look what happened to Job's family. When God brought the disaster, He allowed Satan to actually bring a disaster on them. I don't know who's doing it, but I know that God is in control more than people want to give Him credit. And they're not getting the rain, and we're thinking we're getting too much rain in the Gulf states and up through the central part of our part of the world in Virginia, and they're bone dry out west. And they're right next to the Pacific Ocean. They're as close to the ocean as we are. The wind gets there before it gets here most of the time. And it's circuit. And God says, I control the dips and the lows and the highs. And people don't want to believe that. Well, it doesn't make any difference. God's doing it anyway. And it can create climate change. When you follow the heathenism that's either in our nation or that is in other nations or continents, you see the disasters often that accompany abandonment of God. And the Lord says in verse 25, Your iniquities have turned away these things. Your sins have withheld good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men, 
They lie in wait as he that set a snares. They set a trap and they catch men. They entrap people. They entangle people for their own benefit. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and grown rich. They have grown prosperous. They shine, yea, they pass over the deeds of the wicked. In other words, if you're doing something wicked, we're going to just turn, we're not going to look at you, we're going to leave you alone. But if you're doing something that is legally and righteous, we're going to put you in jail for it. We need to take the Word of God as it is written and learn how to apply it. Not saying that you don't, but as a people, we need to learn to apply the Word of God to our present day. Not thinking that this was just something in 586 B.C. that nowhere has no application for today. That would be saying like Jesus came 2,000 years ago and died on the cross of Calvary, and that was then. It doesn't apply now. Yes, it does. The Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible also says that the Word of God will last forever and the deeds and the works of man will fade away, will pass away with this world. But the, Judah had become a nation that turned away from seeing something that was wicked and evil and rebellious because that's the way the leadership was. That's the way the people were. They didn't want to see that throwing their children in the fire was not wrong. They don't want to see that not taking the cause of the righteous and, and, and giving them a fair shake uh, was not wrong. They didn't want to see that. They pass over the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper in the right of the needy. They do not judge. Shall I punish them for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? An appalling and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets are prophesying falsely, and the priests are bearing rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. What will you do in the end of it all? This bears strong relation to our passage in Lamentations today. And our 13th lesson in Lamentations is entitled, Why We Must Trust in God. None of us much. I know I'm not much. But I know that God is much. And I do trust His Word. I may be a simpleton, but I do trust in the Bible. And if that makes me a simpleton, we'll praise God and pass the biscuits. I'll take that all day long. Our passage, Lamentations 4, 7-22. through 22. Jeremiah, as we brought out, Describe some of the horrors of the siege of the Babylonians upon them. And it was worse than Sodom, as verse 6 says, because at least they were overthrown like Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, when the, drop, the bombs were dropped on them. I think they were hydrogen bombs were dropped on them. But here with Jerusalem, there was a 19-year siege upon them. And so they became famished. They were emaciated physically. Their water supply from outside the city had been cut off. Their food stores were completely depleted. People were bartering for whatever they could barter to get by. They were desperate because there were Babylonian camps, military camps set up all around the city. It had a wide wall. It had powerful gates. But they would lob their missiles in over the top until finally they finally set the city afire and burn it afire. Just like they did the temple in 70 A.D. and burnt it up. And I read one estimate that as many as a million people were killed during this 19-year siege here in Jerusalem. Some have said that almost that many were killed in 70 A.D. in one fell swoop. People crammed into the city because they put their faith in the temple. Well, they wouldn't have had to have crammed in the city to put their faith in the temple if they were putting, if they were putting their faith in the God of the temple. And there are a lot of people who put their faith in religion or their denomination, but they've yet to put their faith in Jesus Christ. That is a big mistake. A terrible mistake. As we have noted, 
Jeremiah was witness to the most horrible of human conditions, which were brought on by a population of self-serving, rebellious people. They became subjected to conditions that had never occurred in their lifetimes. From that historical period in the history of Judah, we all should learn that there is a danger in becoming a self-serving people. And that's what they were, as a self-serving people. They became a people who no longer had gratitude for the blessings of life, so they took them for granted. Some even looked at them as an entitlement. You should never look at a meal as an entitlement. You should never look at housing as an entitlement. You should never look at a paycheck as an entitlement, but something you earn. I'm not talking about people on disability. That's the exception to the rule. Or people who are retired who are making it, sometimes some week to week. I'm talking about people who are of a working age and who are physically and mentally capable of working. We need to be a self-reliant people, but not a self-serving people. Being self-serving is the beginning of the ruin of any individual because it isolates you from the help of others, the love of others, the concern of others. A husband cannot afford to be self-serving. A wife cannot afford to be self-serving. A family cannot afford to be that way. A nation cannot afford to be that way. It is the beginning of an end, or to the end, or of the end. When we become blind to the struggles of all those who are around us, whether they're our friends or not, then we all will fall in the ditch. We do have to care about the other person, and we shouldn't have to have the Uncle Sam telling us to be that way. No. Usually when Uncle Sam is telling you to be watchful or careful about the person around you, it's to serve Uncle Sam or the government, which is a very small percentage of the American. I want you to understand something. Our government is a very small percentage of the American population. Don't think that they're so great and they're so big because they are a very small percentage of the entire 330 million Americans. You have a heart, you have a mind, you have a voice. And when God is the one who is the influencer in your life, your heart, your mind, and your voice reflect that. And God's always caring for other people. And we should be that way. The people in Jerusalem back in 586 and prior to that, all they basically cared for was themselves. They say that in 70 A.D., this is when the Jews were dispersed for the last time, that the infighting was so bad that when the enemy was attacking, they didn't even know they were attacking because the Jews had splintered between the 12 tribes so much in the city of Jerusalem, fighting over this little bit and that little bit, this little piece of power and that piece of power, that they didn't realize that They were being attacked. It was so bad. God rescued the few that still did trust Him. The consequences of abandoning God and turning to idols, as Israel and Judah had done, left them as it would us to depending on our idols. And let me go back to that last point about the people being so Fighting in, there was so much infighting that they did not focus on the welfare of their fellow man. That's exactly what's going on in America. Is that there is so much division and infighting that is destroying us, whether it's by our race or our gender or our politics or our money or our beliefs or whatever else. There's so much infighting that's going on that we need to be careful that we're not going to be all swept away by someone who was watching us for one purpose, and that is to take us all down. There's an old saying that if you want to conquer, you first must divide. And our nation is being divided by color, by creed, by code, you name it, our nation is being divided. Churches are being divided. 
And it is only the Word of God that has the power to unite us with our Maker and us with one another. And we need the Word of God. And the last thing some churches have any intention of offering to their congregations this morning is the Word of God. Thank God for those who still are preaching, thus saith the Lord. But we need To watch, as Marty said in his opening remarks this morning, we need to watch not getting caught up in politics, not getting caught up in everything that's going on. We may speak to it, but we cannot stay focused on it. Our main goal is to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. That's our main goal. That's our, that's our passion. And then to demonstrate that in our treatment of other people. With our present day pandemic, we are being shown how unfulfilling and lifeless idols are. Sports, music, and Hollywood stars have nothing we need, and yet we still clamor for a sporting event, or maybe a new movie that's coming out, or some TV show that can't bring anything new in the fall. But what we all need is a reality check as Christians, because we Believe it or not, we probably follow the world a bit too much and we give maybe perhaps too little attention as to why the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing, as Psalm 2 and verse 1 says. Sometimes we live too close and too comfortable with the world. And in doing so, we find ourselves often in agreement with the world, which finds us at odds with the word of the Lord. We live on the fringes of Christian liberty often. Liberty is your right to do things as a Christian that is not necessarily sinful, but in the wrong context can be taken as sinful because it can cause another person who perhaps doesn't understand your liberty that might, they might cause them to stumble. Paul brings this out in his teaching to the Corinthians. And so there will be times when there might be something that you might do that could cause another Christian to stumble that perhaps you shouldn't do or I shouldn't do. That's my liberty. It's not sinful. And we can't always live our life thinking, you know, uh, I'm going to be judged for this. I'm going to be judged for that. But there are times when we know something that's probably not kosher as a Christian, that we should do. And sometimes we might think, well, I have my rights as a Christian. I have my rights as an American. And certainly we may have our rights, but we should never let our rights trump our responsibility to be a witness to our brother and sister in the Lord or to represent our Lord. And I think all of us have had occasions of that. We live on the fringes often of Christian liberty, partaking of the whatever the world has to offer while longing for the freedoms of a world that is lost and without God. Sometimes we kind of envy the things that the world does who don't know Christ as their Savior. We kind of envy some of the things that they do because perhaps they are fun and maybe they are innocent. But they're not best. And I'm just saying, sometimes we do, all of us as Christians, can get maybe a little too more too comfortable with the world. And the problem with that is, is that often the world then gets its hooks in us. And then there becomes the expectation to maintain that aura of ourself, our image. And Christ gets lost in the mix. And what eventually happens or possibly happens is that we end up having uh, a a false sense of our own identity. And in that guilt, often we go back into the world with its loving embrace. Y'all smelling what I'm stepping in this morning? Okay, because I am. I am. We have to watch when we get the loving embrace of the world that that's how it begins with turning away from the Lord. Because these two are not on the same page. The world and the Lord are not on the same page. 
and we have to pick a side. And we're Christians, it's not uncomfortable straddling the fence for anyone. And we do so without a thought and without ever mentioning the soul-saving message of the gospel often when we become comfortable with the world. And so we have to take stock, in other words. Father, we ask as we go into these verses this morning that you will bless the truth, bless your word. Help us to understand what we're hearing from your word today. Help us, as Jeremiah 5 tells us, Lord, that we would not be like those who do not have eyes to see or ears to hear, but we are like those who do have eyes to see and ears to hear the things that the Spirit says. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Verse 7, Jeremiah goes on in Lamentations chapter 4 saying, Her Nazarites... Uh, the noblemen of the city were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. What in the wide world of sports is he talking about here? Well, her Nazarites or nobles were those who were once like a Nazarite. They were separated unto the Lord's service. And they were purer than snow, referring to their character, referring to their pristine, uh, the way they carried or conducted themselves, their, their social deportment. They didn't act like a tramp, didn't talk like a tramp or a bum. They were young, well, Groomed, well-mannered representatives of the courts of Jerusalem. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. And what does that mean? These guys were cut. They were chiseled. They went to the gym. They worked out. They wanted to look good in their outfit. Their robes, whatever it is that they wore, they made what they wore look good. And their polishing was a sapphire. In other words, they had an overall attire and an overall presentation of themselves that was exquisite. This is under Merrill Unger's uh, study of the history of those who were called the Nazarites or nobles of that day in Jerusalem. And that all ended. That all ended. These were the people who were, who were in charge who were to be looked up to, who were respected in the community, and they cared about what came out of their mouth. They cared about their character, what was said to them. They cared about what happened and what they did after dark. They cared about who they walked with and who they associated with. They cared about their business dealings. And they were in charge of things that were dealing with the public in that day. They weren't the kings or princes, but they were high officials and they were well respected and they respected themselves and they did everything they could to garner and to maintain that respect. You know what I'm saying? That's not easy to do. Even if I try, I can't do all those things. But they did for the benefit of the people, not to make a big shot out of themselves. But that all ended. Their visage now, verse 8 says, since they're starving, since the water and the food supplies have been cut off, since disease has started to become rampant in the city, their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin clings to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. They who are slain with the sword are better than they who are slain with hunger. At least it's a quick death. Dying of starvation is a painful way for a person to die. For these pine away, stricken through for lack of the fruits of the field. The hands of the tender-hearted women have boiled their own children. They were their, they were their food in the destruction of the daughter of my people. These noble men became rec- unrecognizable due to the siege of the Babylonians. Again, it had been going on since 604 B.C. It was now 586. Time goes backwards, as you know, there in the Old Testament timing. And so they became unrecognizable. 
As I said last week, people would be in the city dump collecting food somehow or another to get by on what somebody he may have thrown away or discarded that they may could have used to have a little bite to eat for that night. Maybe something the Babylonians had thrown over the wall or something. But imagine the sadness of that, of down scrunching and scrounging through a dump and looking over to your side as you're down in the stench and looking over the side and there's the mayor of the town over there scrounging around in his old raggedy hind end it closes. Imagine the woman that worked in the, in the, the, uh, gift shop or she worked uh, in the tailor shop and she made clothing and she was a fine woman and she dressed in the best and you look over there and there she is down on her knees pawing like a chicken in a cow pile trying to find some I'm just telling you that's how bad it was And I've said that before, but it, sometimes it just sticks with me. I have a hard time getting, getting it out of my mouth, and, but not saying it. I have a hard time not saying it because I see it so vivid in my imagination. I guess I've got a terrible imagination. But I see what the Bible says. Jesus says, if you have eyes to see, do you see what the Spirit is saying? And do you have ears to hear? I see it. I hear it. I hope you do. We don't want that to be our case. Somalia would tell you otherwise. North Korean families who have been abandoned will tell us otherwise. It can't happen. Starvation and desperation took their toll on these noble men. It would be better to die in health at the edge of a sword, it says, than to endure what seemed an endless death by starvation and thirst and fear. And as verse 10, we have already spoken of the unspeakable acts of cannibalism upon their own children as we read last week. No need to belabor that point. In verse 11, the Lord hath accomplished His fury. He hath poured out His fierce anger. He hath kindled a fire in Zion and it hath devoured its foundations. The Lord says, I'm going to send a people of a strange language, of an ancient a cultural background. I'm going to send them to you and they're going to take your your daughters, they're going to take your boys, they're going to take your men, and they're going to use them for whatever they want to use them for, just like they did Daniel and his three, three friends and others. The Lord has accomplished His fury. He's poured out His fierce anger. He's kindled the fire in, in Jerusalem, and it hath devoured the, its foundations. Now we see a further explanation as to why all of this tragedy, and I call it a tragedy because it all could have been prevented. And not only that, but they would have been blessed beyond all human imagination. I want you just for a moment to back up to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 28, if you would please. Deuteronomy chapter 28. This is a passage that I used as a text in the book that I wrote, A Nation Under God. And comparing what Jerusalem and Judah went through and what God foretold that would happen to them if they turned their back on God, and it did happen. And I wrote this book primarily to help people to understand that America could could repeat and be a repeat of what Israel was in 586 B.C. if we don't change our ways. We are a nation that has been tremendously blessed. And we are turning our back on the Lord. And not all, but typically I will say this, leadership reflects its people. Leadership and those in leadership, not just the president, but as a whole, leadership reflects its people, especially in a republic. Because in a republic, we elect officials. We call it a democracy. We elect officials to make choices and decisions for us. And we elect them however many years to lead, to make choices for us. And those people reflect our values, what we believe. And that's significant because the people who are in leadership now reflect the values of what the American people believe. And there are different spots all over the country that believe different things, and that's their right. 
but there are either blessings or sufferings associated with those choices because God doesn't care whether you're a Republican, Independent, Democrat, Libertarian, enough. God does not care. You're either going to do what's right and, and then in that case you're going to be blessed or you're going to do what's wrong in His eyes and you're going to be cursed for it. God says, I will not be mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians chapter 5 teaches us. God's not going to be mocked. Whatsoever a man or a woman sows, that shall they also reap. And so God told him in Deuteronomy chapter 28, this is what you're going to reap if you do good. And then the rest of the chapter, which is the biggest part, says this is what you're going to reap if you do evil. And the book of Lamentations shows us which choice they made, which was evil. Deuteronomy 28. I'll just read just a couple of verses here. Verse 1, And it shall come to pass, this is when they go into the land, when you go into the promised land, set up your families and everything else, this is what I will do for you, God says. He didn't bring Abraham out of the earth of the Chaldees for nothing. He didn't establish these people for nothing. He said, It shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all of His commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. You'll be the most powerful nation on the earth. Hey, I think that's America. At one time it was maybe Germany or some other country. It was the the United Kingdom or Great Britain for years. I mean, they were the most powerful a military political force on the face of the earth at one time. They, they were the most powerful economic force on the face of the earth. That's why they had colonies all over the globe. And still do in some places. Anyway. All these blessings shall come, which he's going to enumerate, shall come on thee and overtake thee. There will be so much you won't know what to do with it. As that old fellow said, it's in the White House. You'll be getting so much money, you'll say, stop, stop. Can't take it anymore. Being facetious, of course. <laughs> but all these blessings, God says, shall come upon thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And there's where a lot of people say, i got a problem with that. I want to do my own thing. Well, as long as it doesn't violate my justice, go ahead. But usually it does violate the justice of God. And I want to remind us all that the justice of God never sleeps. We might want it to, but we really don't. Because we also want God's justice to be there to avenge us when we've been ill-treated, don't we? Lord, I, I hope there's a special place for him or her. See, we want God to be there to be just when we're mistreated. And we also want God there to be just when we want to be blessed, and we can be. He said, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the countryside or the field. So it's just not uh, the suburban areas or the rural areas that God will bless, but God, now y'all might think it is, maybe you won't, but some people might think that if you live in an urban setting, it's got to be a blighted community. It's got to be projects. It's, I've been in projects before. Some of you have too, perhaps. I mean rough projects. That you're living in an urban... I've seen so much. My wife and I went to New York City a couple of times the past few years, and we took the Amtrak, which is a not a bad way. Some of you have traveled Amtrak. Not a bad way to travel, provided you don't run into another train doing 150 miles an hour or slam into a wall somewhere or go down in a ravine. But we went through some rough areas where this Amtrak went through and we saw the row houses in Baltimore and some other places and it just made me want to throw up. It looked so bad if we went wrong. I had this thing, I thought to myself, can that guy drive his train any faster? Some of you have seen it. It's horrible. The conditions that so many people are born into, they can't help it. They're born into it. But the Bible says that can be a beautiful place. The Bible says that can be a wonderful place. Just because you live in an urban environment does not mean it has to be bad or riddled with crime and violence. 
and fear. The Bible says if you remember the Lord God, you won't have that. Rather than Jesus roaming the streets of Baltimore and that particular area that we saw, demons roamed those streets. Predators. Now, I'm not saying there aren't good people in every community. There's bad people in the countryside as well. But the Bible says if we choose to follow the Lord God, we're not going to have all this wickedness. We're not going to have all this crime in Chicago and everywhere else. Blessed shalt thou be in the city. And blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of the body. And the fruit of the ground. You'll have a healthier, happier Citizenry, you'll have better health, better mental health, better physical health. Better mental health often leads to good physical health. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy ground, the fruit of thy cattle, the increase. In other words, the stock market is going to explode. People are going to be making good money. And the flocks and the cows and the flocks of thy sheep. Personal prosperity there. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy kneading trough. That is the place where you store and squirrel away your retirement. Or you have a nest egg, okay? Or your place where you put away some money for the future or emergency. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest. In other words, there will be peace at home. Won't be fighting over money. Won't be fighting over things because you're keeping God in your home. Won't be fighting over you know, what the neighbors are doing and what somebody's doing because you're trusting in the Lord. The Lord shall cause thine enemies who rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. Because you believe in ending wars, not continuing wars. You just put a big hole in the ground where everybody keeps on fighting and poking at you. And you let the rest of the world stand around and look into that hole and say, Boy, we better not do this. Well, they're going to put a hole over here where we are. We're not going to see the light of day again. That's the most merciful way to end a war is just blow the living hell out of them. And it's over with. A pacifist doesn't understand that. A fascist doesn't either. But that's the way you end wars, the most merciful thing you can do. Or we can just let our Marines just keep on dying in Guadalcanal. We can just let our Marines keep on dying in the Philippines. Just keep on bringing the Navy and and the Army that's been in Europe. We're just going to put them on ships and planes and send them into the the Hawaiian Islands and send them on down uh, to Midway and down through there and just let them continue to perpetually be peppered by the Japanese as it was in World War II. Or we could just take a couple of big old bombs over there and drop them on two cities and shut them up. We gave them an opportunity to surrender, and they said, I don't think so. If we're going to expand our Japanese empire, we're going to have to get more fuel. We're going to have to get more oil. We're going to go all the way down to Australia and take theirs too. We're going to go all the way down the Indonesian coastline, and we're just going to take all their fuel. And by the way, we're going to the Hawaiian Islands, and we're going to get rid of those ships so they can't blockade us from doing it. They're weak, they're vulnerable, America is, because we're starting to send since 1941, we're sending troops over, over into Europe. We're weak, we're susceptible, uh, we'll hit them in the backside, where they're, we'll, get a, we'll get them on their six. You see where I'm going with this, yeah, yeah, okay. God says, we will... Give you the, you will have the courage to do the tough stuff. And your, your citizens will support you. Now our citizens won't support that. Our citizens won't support any such a move as that anymore. That's why we've got an 18 year protracted war in Afghanistan. Because we don't have the nerve in America to do what needs to be done. If anything at all needs to be done. I say bring them home. Let what happens happen. Trust in the Lord. And that's what the Lord says. I'll give you strength against your enemies. I'll give you that respect that is around. Uh, and look here at verse 7. The Lord shall cause thine enemies who rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before you seven different ways. They cannot get away from you fast enough. That's what he's saying. You will have such military dominance. Shock and all is what Bush called it. But you will have such military dominance that they don't want to mess with you. 
That's the way you have to do it. If you cannot, first of all, through diplomacy, make things work, then you have to just blast the living daylights out of them and don't stop until they say, Uncle. You cannot. You have to suffocate them with force. If not, it's going to be your grandsons that are going to be going to war unnecessarily. Well, some of you have got grandsons in there. I've got grandsons and granddaughters, and some granddaughters will go too. Do you want your grandsons to go into a protracted war where leadership is too chicken to get the job done? Well, that is part of the five cycles of divine discipline. And the fourth cycle, leadership in the military is afraid to do its job because the politicians won't let them. And we don't want war. We don't, nobody, some of you who have been in war here, you don't want it. The Lord shall cause thy enemies to rise up against thee to be smitten. Verse 7, the Lord shall command the blessings upon thee in the storehouses. And all that thou settest thine hand in, the Lord shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself. He has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandment of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord. And they shall be afraid of thee. In other words, there is international respect for you. Back in that day before Jerusalem and, and Judah and Israel had corrupted and separated as a nation, when, when they heard that the Israelites were coming, the people trembled in fear and started surrendering and sending gifts to the kings of Israel before they even set foot in their land. And they wanted to do everything they could to be allies. Because they were a fearful people. And the only reason the Israelites were fearful warriors is because God did supernatural things with their armies. God did things with their armies that their armies should not have been able to have done. If you'll study your history, you'll see that God has done things with American military might that we should never have accomplished. We should have been shot down before we got there. We sh- our ships should have sank before we got there. There's no way that we should have accomplished some of the things that we accomplished. And when we went in, in World War II, when those first waves went in to Omaha Beach, there's no way that we should have been able to continue to, to accomplish what we accomplished. And a lot of lives were lost, we know. All the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And an internationalist leader feels like no one should be afraid of any other nation because they're an ostrich. they got their head in the sand. They don't see the evil that's in mankind, but the Lord sees it. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods and the fruits of thy body and the fruits of thy cattle and the fruits of thy ground and the land which the Lord sworn to thy fathers to give thee. And the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure... The heavens shall give the rain into all the land in its season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. How much do we owe China now? My word. We are supposed to be the nation that lends to China, not one that borrows from China. That has changed, hasn't it, people? And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only. Some people think, especially some politicians think, that it's wrong for you to be above the other nations. Well, would you rather be beneath them? And thou shalt be, not be beneath. If thou hearken unto the commandment of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods and to serve them. But it shall come to pass, thou wilt not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all of his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses that I, he's going to enumerate shall come upon thee and shall overtake thee. The Lord, because of his righteousness and his justice, does not stand for rivals. And thus he accomplished 
As it says in Lamentations 4, 7, his fury and showing his fierce, righteous indignation. He hath kindled a fire in Zion, he says, and it has devoured its foundations. The Jews thought no one could breach the walls of Jerusalem. Lamentations 4, 12 says, The kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. They thought their defensive walls around the city which had been built, which were massive and wide, and that they were also uh, rebuilt again and strengthened. Second Chronicles 32, verses 2 through 5. Second Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 14 shows where they had done all of this stuff in defending, building up their city's defenses. Their food stores were built up strongly. And their water supply tunnel system had been built earlier by former King Hezekiah, which was second to none in the world. The aqueducts that he built going into Jerusalem were for that very purpose were they to be attacked because he recognized to what happened to the northern kingdoms by way of Sennacherib II and the Assyrians that they had better get something done to make sure that if anyone, because the Assyrians came down there too to Jerusalem, they wanted to take the southern kingdom too. And the Lord forestalled that. And Hezekiah prayed for God's leadership. And God, through that that king, averted them being taken as well by the, that time by the Assyrians. But years later, it happened and the south succumbed to it too. But Hezekiah had the wisdom to have a aqueduct system built in to help them make sure that because he knew that if if the enemy came there's no way they'd get water so they had underground channels of water sent to them you got to have water that's the number one commodity in in a desert region water the inhabitants of jerusalem also thought that they were keeping the enemy out but the truth is their problem is that they had become the enemy because they kept god out they kept god out as a majority of the population, not everybody. Now, get me, don't get, don't get me wrong. There was a remnant that did love God and did serve the Lord in honesty and faithfulness and with virtue. But they went along, Daniel, Jeremiah, and others, Ezekiel, and others. They served the Lord faithfully, but they suffered along with the ungodly. And I'm telling you, if you're a faithful person to God, you love God, you're a good person, and you want to do the right thing, you stand against evil. If evil is that great, you will suffer along with the evil people. Don't forget that. Don't think that the rapture is going to save America from American Christians from some evil that might come upon us. Because if God so chose to not have the rapture for another thousand years, your plan, uh, I hate to say it, but your plan sucks. It doesn't work. You have got to have a plan that you're going to be a voice for the Lord. You're not going to be a political rival and all that stuff, but you're going to live for the Lord. But if I'm thinking, well, God's just going to yank me out. I'm not going to worry about it. That's like the ostrich that sticks its head in the sand and says, I don't care how I live. I'll be all right. I know there's that teaching somewhere over there in the Bible about the rapture and Jesus coming after us. I'm just going to rely on that and live like a devil. Really? Don't count on that. We might be the greatest nation in the world right now, but it's only by the grace of God. And if we reject the Word and the grace of God... There wouldn't be nothing great about us. Some people have got a terrible plan when it comes to how they deal in preparing for the future. And most of the time, it's not a biblical plan at all. It's dumb. I know people who are actually putting in food stores and building bunkers in case the rapture happens or the tribulation period begins. Uh, like you can hide in a hole in the ground from God. I hope you don't believe that's the way it's going to happen when the resurrection comes because you sure would like for Him to find you then, wouldn't you? See how dumb people are? If I can be alive in a concrete bunker, I won't be subject to the troubles that are going on in this world. I'll, I'll work my way through it. I'll, my, I'll, I'll, we'll, work, we'll work through it after a while and we'll finally come out. 
<laughs> you say, people don't do that. There's been movies about people doing that. This man took his whole family and moved into a bunker. And finally, when the fellow finally came out, they wanted to know what in the world happened in the world. I can't remember the guy's name, but it was pretty good. And the, his son finally realized, Dad, nothing happened. There wasn't a bomb. Didn't go off. Nothing of this really happened. You just thought it was going to happen. And you sequestered me away in the house. I'm a 25-year-old man, and I've never been in the outside world. I, I don't know how to, how, to, how to function. And the bomb never came. You go outside and you, you look up, you know, the, there's a satellite watching me or something. Just trust in the Lord. The Lord showed them that they needed to trust Him and not in their own resources. None of us can outsmart or outlast God. God is not our adversary. God is not our competition. But if we make God our adversary, we will be very sorry indeed. Hebrews 10.31 says, Our Lord is a consuming fire. Jesus Christ the Lord said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 6.6 6 and Luke 4.21 This same God of the Old Testament is the same as Jesus Christ. No different. Remember Micah 5.2 that Jesus is from everlasting. Not just some 2,000 year ago Johnny come lately. The Lord God entered into the gates of Jerusalem by way of the Babylonians. They were the tool of His discipline. God did this, as we have stated since the beginning of the study, because verses 13 through 20 says, and we close here, for the sins of her prophets, that's why God came, and for the iniquities of her priest. And they were held primarily responsible for God's judgment coming, because they were the leadership that followed people who wanted what they didn't want, which was bad leadership, and the leadership should have pushed back against them, and they didn't. The two groups that most were responsible uh, was the religious leaders and the government class. The religious class and the government class. They put their dependence on men rather than on God. The first judgment is seen in chapter thirteen, verse chapter four, verses thirteen through twenty. The first judgment is seen uh, as we look at verse 13 here just for a moment as we close. For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her, they have wandered like blind men in the streets and they have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. They cried unto them, Depart unclean, depart, depart, touch not. When they fled away and wandered, they said among the nations, They shall no more sojourn here. These were the false prophets and the wicked priests. And they had gotten to where their, their, their work as prophets and priests was so bad, they ended up being treated as though they were lepers, that they were unclean. Their lies were revealed and they were cast aside and banished from the public as those who had contracted actual leprosy. The anger of the Lord that divided them, He will no longer regard them. They respected not the persons of the priests, and the people ended up favoring not the elders. No one respected these prophets and priests any longer because they were liars, because they said no judgment was coming, and they had endured judgment for 19 years. But it mattered not once judgment came. Those who tell you what you want to hear and what serves your personal interest are useless in the day of tribulation. Now that's why I'm against some of these churches that appeal to just certain niches or groups of interested parties. And they have particular uh, Bible studies that are just for those groups that are interested in certain things. Because you're only there to get what you're interested in rather than what God says that you need to hear. People need to hear the whole counsel of God's Word. These Jews trusted in foreign powers like Egypt and others instead of the Lord as they 
ask in vain for help, as verse 17 says, and as for us, our eyes as yet fail for vain help. In our watching, we watch for a nation that could not save us. Now, verses 18 through 22 also shows that the enemy was too strong to stand against. They hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. The Babylonians were everywhere. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled for our end is come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the villages, wilderness. Because some of the Jews that decided to try to escape uh, in the city walls would run in the, they had passed and traveled roads going uh, down to Egypt. That's where a lot of them went because that's where their forefathers came from. So they were familiar with that. And so they would go to Egypt. Though it had been almost 900 years since they came out, they were always going back and forth trusting in Egypt, showing that they trusted in government, they trusted in the arm of man, they'd stopped trusting in the Lord. And ever since they came out of Egypt, God was saying, trust me. Took them through the Red Sea on dry land. Trust me. Saw them through with food and shelter and clothing for 40 years in the wilderness. The Lord says, I've shown that you can trust me. I had water where there were no wells. I've shown that you can trust me. And they wouldn't. They kept running back to Egypt. Do you have an Egypt that you keep running back to? Symbolically speaking or figuratively speaking. And so as they were running back to Egypt, the Babylonians military would go fetch them and either kill them or haul them back. They laid wait for us in the wilderness, verse 19 says. They had scouts out everywhere. The breath of our nostrils, the anointing of the Lord was taken in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. The enemy was too strong to stand against. And without the Lord's help, they were also helpless. Rejoice and be glad, verse 21 says, O daughter of Edom. Now these were Esau's descendants. And Edom, as Esau's defendants, descendants, Esau was Jacob's brother. Remember? And Jacob was renamed Israel. And he had twelve sons. The twelve sons or twelve tribes of Israel. And Esau sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for a bowl of oatmeal. Remember, he didn't care about the spiritual welfare of Israel. And Edomites still did not care about the spiritual welfare of Israel. They wanted to see Israel fall. And there was a hatred against all of the descendants of Jacob hyphenated slash Israel. He was renamed Israel. Remember that. And so his brother hated him. And his descendants, the Edomites, hated Israel. All the Jews as well. Rejoice and be glad, O daughters of Edom, that dwell us in the land of us, because you finally got your wish. Now we're being judged. Now your brother Jacob's children are being judged. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. The Lord says, Edomites, you're going to be judged too, because you stood back and snickered while your descendant's brother Jacob's children were being judged. Punished. Thou shalt be drunk and shalt make thyself naked, it says here. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will, he will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will punish thy iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will uncover thy sins. Here's just the bright light at the end of this. The cup of judgment would also fall upon the enemies of Israel. Edom had contributed to Judah's calamity as per Jeremiah 49, verses 7 through 22. She too would have to drink from the cup of God's wrath and have no choice in the matter. So Edom rejoiced in Judah and Jerusalem's fall, but not for long. No need to rejoice over a nation being judged by God, for if we're doing the same thing in our nation, we too will have our day in God's court. 
The last words of encouragement from this chapter 4 is seen where it says, The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. Your judgment and captivity will end. That is, after 70 years, as we will see. But Edom's judgment did not end. Israel would go, Judah would go into captivity for 70 years in Babylonian captivity and military dominance. But that would eventually end. That's where the book of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah describe what that was like when they finally left after that seven years. And though that's written way back here in the history books, this is in a prophecy book. It was back in the history book. So if you go back and read uh, uh, Esau, uh, read uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, you will see the account of that 70 years of captivity coming to an end. A whole lot to take in there. But one of the things I just want to close with in this lesson is that Things can get really bad really fast, and we've been forewarned. And the thing of it is that's really sad is that it doesn't have to be that way. It could have all been avoided if people would just be disciplined and had the humility to follow God and to do what God says. It could have all been avoided. If a parent tells their child, if you don't behave, you're going to get a spanking. Or if you don't behave, uh, you're going to have your whatever, your phone or whatever taken away from you for a week. Or you're going to have, you're going to lose privileges uh, with the car if you're a teenager because it's a privilege to have a car and to drive on the highways. If you don't do this, you're not, we're not going to let you do that. And if the child knows that and they break the rule anyway, the parent has got to stick by what they said. Because the kids need to learn that there are consequences and, 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 and to their circum, to their, just their, their choices. And the parent is the first one to teach their kids that there are consequences to doing what's wrong. And God's telling us there are consequences for us doing what is wrong. And if we don't listen, we're going to pay the consequences. You know that. Father, thank you for your blessings, for your word, for the strength you give us, for those who've come out, who've heard this, uh, this preacher say what he said. And Father, we realize that none of us are perfect. None of us are, are righteous. No, not one. The only Jesus Christ is perfect and righteous. And we are thankful that in your grace you allow us to be in your royal family. Thank you for this exhausting book. And I say that with respect, Father. That what we are hearing and seeing and experiencing in this book is just reading, is just imagining, but that it was a reality for your people back in the day. It's a reality that you don't want repeated in our lives today, but we, it could happen because you're still the same God. And so, Father, we ask for your forgiveness of our sins, and we ask you to turn us back to righteousness. Hear our prayer, Father. We do ask that we will turn from our wicked ways, whatever they may be, that we will seek your face in your word, and that we will lift up our prayers to you, and that you will hear our prayers and you will heal our land. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you'll do that. We realize that we're not a perfect people. And we, Father, realize that we have a message to carry out to the world that cannot be afforded to be kept closed up in our mouths and our hearts and our minds. And that we cannot afford to sit on the fence of compromise with the world, realizing that that just makes us comfortable with a place that does not find friendship with you. And so, Father, we ask for your grace and strength and mercy. Thank you again for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and all that he did for us on the cross of Calvary, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen.